Welcome to our podcast, Moja Kafa. We are Ivana and Maki, your host. In this podcast, we discuss interesting details about Serbian language and culture from a learner's and teacher's perspective. We offer new and fun resources for learners of Serbian. To follow each episode with annotated script, vocabulary and quizzes, join us also at Moja Kafa Podcast on Instagram. So if you're ready, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy the podcast. Zdravo svima. Zdravo. Ovdje je Maki i... I Ivana. Okay, today we have a different episode for you guys, yeah. which I'm very excited about. I'm also very excited because I don't really know what the questions are going to be like, but um, mm-hmm. but yeah, let's see. <laughs> so I read this book, A Guide to Serbian Ment- Mentality, by... Uh, Momo Kapor. A very mm-hmm. famous um, painter and poet from and writer from Serbia. Actually, he's from Sarajevo, Bosnia. I think. Yeah, Sarajevo. Yeah, but it was it's again like we didn't separate it before, right? Because it was like yeah. the whole Yugoslavia. So yeah, mm-hmm. for us, it's we we can say I don't want to be like you know Serbs take credit for everything, <laughs> but we do appreciate him. And if he identifies as a Serb at a certain point, if he identified, then that's fine by us, of you course. know. But I think it's important to state that he is from Sarajevo. Mm-hmm. And I recommend this book to Serbians or tourists or people who are in- into Serbian culture because that book is really fun to yeah. read. Lots of illustrations by him and uh, lots of funny details. Like he criticizes and loves Serbian culture. So <laughs> that's really good. I think that's full something. Of emotions. Yeah, that's something we should do in our podcast too, right? You should we should also point out like the negatives as well as the positives. Mm-hmm. What's the name of the book? A guide to Serbian mentality. Okay, good. Mind so, you guys, I didn't read this. I actually um, I saw it in in the in the bookstore, and um, I thought, oh my god, that would be like the best thing for like for example my boyfriend to learn who I am, <laughs> like to learn a bit about myself before he we get mm-hmm. into some issues. So, yeah. <laughs> But still, after reading that, uh, yeah, it is mostly talking about Belgrade people. Mm-hmm. So, the city, Belgrade, and the life in Belgrade. But still, of course, it covers all Serbia. Yeah. But mostly Belgrade, let's say. Yeah, but I think that's okay for most of our like listeners who want to travel to Serbia. They're first probably going to go to Belgrade. So still, I think mm-hmm. still is really relevant. And as Definitely. you said, there are slight differences in different regions probably. But I think that, um, yeah, I think overall it kind of like covers probably the mentality. And mm-hmm. I just want to preface that I am not from Belgrade. I've never lived in Belgrade. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to have a, a different point of view. Maybe we should also interview someone who's from Belgrade to see what they have to say. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, so if any of uh, the listeners uh, is from Belgrade, they can share their comments if they agree or disagree with the author. Yeah, exactly. So let's start with number one, a quotation from the book. Okay. He says, we Serbs drink tea only when we are taken ill and milk only when being breastfed. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay What? so he's talking about the shumadia tea and criticizes not criticizes but compares it with the british tea like five o'clock tea mm. uh, time so he says for us it's weird because for us you don't take milk with the tea and if you're taking tea probably you're ill <laughs> exactly I usually like nowadays I actually drink tea sometimes like even when I want to get warm or whatever but Yeah, it's not a big thing. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. something you drink by default. It's when I was younger, I I would only drink tea when I was ill, right? So yeah. you can drink like juices or like rakia or something during the day. But when you're ill, then yeah, then you like drink tons of teas. <laughs> so that it's not in our culture to have like these tea sessions. And you see, it's mm-hmm. coffee because of mm-hmm. moja kafa. Definitely. Yeah, but and milk? Oh, milk and tea? No, 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 no. Like Never, uh, ever, you you. Can, <laughs> we are okay with the sugar, and we are okay mm-hmm. with lemon. But milk? That's true. No. And did you know that actually your shmadia tea, which is by the way with alcohol and warm tea in alcohol, I guess. I didn't did know, know about that. that. What um, do you know about shmadia? Shmadia. 
about Shumadia? Shumadia, the, what I know is like that's like the place of uh, having like fruit. There's like where all the fruits can be found, mm. you know. That's what I know about Shumadia, like mostly. But I didn't really know about Shumadia tea. But which alcohol do you use? So they use, um, I forgot it now, probably brandy. It's called yeah. brandy, but rakia probably. Probably, actually. So yeah. they put rakia in warm tea, and they can drink it in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, doesn't matter. <laughs> that kind of goes hand in hand with, like what my grandpa is doing like he drinks like a shot of rakia every morning right and usually it's mm-hmm. some sort of like with some herb or something like that or like from walnuts you know mm-hmm. oh actually with walnuts. is it warm so or cold it's cold actually it's not with tea we mm-hmm. don't drink it with tea but i'm just talking about mm-hmm. my experience this does not mean that this yeah. is not the truth <laughs> i'm just saying what i like grew <laughs> up with but interesting. So now I know when I go to Shumadia, I need to drink that tea. <laughs> At least try it. <laughs> All right. So Shumadia tea is with the uh, brandy or rakia and warm. And it's yes, I it's do. similar to actually Japan's sake or sake they write. They write ah, know? sake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yeah. But sake is sweet, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. Shumadia oh. is sweet, too. They add sugar. Brandy and tea. So then I then it's probably tasty actually. If it's like sake, then yeah, it's good. And the next one is about the uh, the effect of rivers and sky on people. So he says, as we have like rivers coming together, going from different directions to different places and sky is mostly cloudy on on the rivers and you don't know when it's going to be windy or you know when it's going to be cold all of a sudden or warm so that's why people are also um broad of gesture stormy of temperament and change in mood oh you know i cannot attest that because i did not grow up next to the uh, river Hmm. So I don't really know. So you're basically saying that that people are a bit uh, changeable mm-hmm. mood Moody, and yeah. of the changeable mood and like, yeah. Huh. Uses a lot you of know, uh, gesture. Uh, it uses a lot of gesture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's maybe that's true. I do have mm-hmm. to say that like the stereotype about my part, because again, we're not right, like right on the river, like next to the river. Um, we are very like mellow and like uh, it's okay everything's fine nothing can like aggravate us Mm. so maybe that's actually the support for what you're saying because we're not living right next to the river or Mm. like on the river so the weather or the rivers do not change so you you guys are calmer makes sense did you notice something like that can you test it i mean i didn't test because i i just visited no said so i cannot understand how people react to things so mm-hmm. but in the south people are, people are more active this is what i saw like they are going always to something hiking or skiing or every mm-hmm. season they have something to do in the summer they go to the river all the time so they are always moving around <laughs> yeah i can actually see that happening yeah because there's definitely a definitely like a very different mentality compa- like when you compare south to the mm-hmm. north and because like there's a bit more nature and rivers down in the south, um, yeah. south so yeah okay yeah. now i will ask you a question so as a person from serbia try to find two things that no one else has in the world you know that's actually quite difficult to try let me see not to see, but to try. Uh, to try, like food. Mm-hmm. That no one has. I mean, chewabi, no everybody has, right? In the Turkey, in Iran, in other yeah. places. But your two things here are unique. And actually, before he said it, I knew one of them, but the other one, I don't know. I don't know, because I'm thinking like about... Um, there's also like ver- always variations of something. I'm thinking like like kaimak or like thinking kaimak? Like maybe some a kaimak yeah. was one of them. Bingo. Oh, cool. Okay, <laughs> but it's a type of a dairy, right? So I'm thinking maybe it's a type of dairy, but like. I mean, think about the Netherlands. They are 
like famous for their their products, but they don't have anything similar to Kaimak. Or in Turkey, we yeah. we have a lot of things from, and we have Kaimak as well, but it's a completely different thing. It's sweet and it's eaten with sweet things. So for you, Kaimak is a side dish for salty food, right? It is. Salty. It is. What is the second thing? Pırstasi. What? <laughs> the seashells. What? Called pırstasi. Pırstaci, sorry. Pırstaci. You know... So they are found oh, stuck man. to underwater rocks. <laughs> oh, I know why I don't really know about it. Because I've never tried it. Because Me neither, I hate so I seafood. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, oh, okay. Tell me more about it. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, these seashells are not found in any other menu in other countries, as far as he knows. I mean, he hasn't found it anywhere else. So this is eaten in Serbia. But you know what? Mm-hmm. That's from the sea, right? Shells from the sea. Sea or river, I thought, maybe. Ah, or, or river, maybe. Because I'm thinking, because like... um. There's no the reason sea why I don't here, like so. seafood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, it's from in Croatia, actually. You can find them. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Let's it must be from the sea, though. It's the sea. Yeah, it's the um, Adriatic mm-hmm. Sea. And in the... Is there a thing like a Red Sea? Ah, okay. Ah, Suez. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. But that's the reason why I didn't really know about it. Because I'm like... You know, you you need to see for that. And I wasn't mm-hmm. like, I didn't grow up there. So I had a different cuisine. But I learned something new. <laughs> no. <laughs> cool. Pistachi. Good. No, I know. And uh, next one is about a part of clothing. Saikacha. Saikacha. Sorry. I wrote in mm-hmm. English alphabets. <laughs> Saikacha. <laughs> uh-huh. So what, what does it... Uh, symbolize for you like what is it the symbol for um what brings to to your mind the war i don't know like (laughs) shy um actually Mm -hmm. let me just google that's true it is a part of military in times of war but in times of peace it tends to look I mean, people tend to look a bit like they are at war, even though they are not in war, because they keep wearing it. So he said it's a form of courage, tenderness, and spite. (laughs) Oh, that's good. Again, I wasn't really surrounded because I think this is not so common in the North. Mm -hmm. but i definitely when i think about like the traditional way of dressing or whatever that's definitely something that pops like into my mind um so Mm -hmm. yeah they're like usually like kind of uh greenish grayish how they look that like and they were adapted from a certain war i think but they didn't just like Mm -hmm. stuck you know yeah they wear it all the time he says (laughs) i mean in villages probably yeah (laughs) let me just see if uh shaikacha is a serbian national hat okay traditionally worn by men in the serbian countryside it is named after serb river troops known as shaikashi who protected the austrian empire exactly against the ottoman turks in the 18th century i just want to see if um if there's something yeah i i i have to be honest i haven't really been surrounded by it i've seen it Mm -hmm. like i know how Mm -hmm. it looks like and everything Mm -hmm. but actually my grandpa wears a slightly different hat so that's why for me but i'm pretty sure everyone else is gonna be like oh my god how do you know about it like all the people in the village wear it like of course it's guys right it's usually i don't think i've seen a girl wear that or like a woman or anything like that but yeah shakach i think is a very important kind of like symbol I think so too. I haven't seen it either as well here. I mean, maybe I saw, but from now on, I will be more careful <laughs> if I see it. But any. I think probably, as he said, more in the village than because mm-hmm. we're living in cities, right, or towns. Yeah. So probably more when you go like to the village. That's mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. that's where you can find that's it. True. And when you talk about, I mean, as we already mentioned, Ottoman Empire, I yeah. will ask you: mm, When do you think Rakia became? more and more popular or like became like a real drink 
for servings. I mean, who doesn't like the effects of alcohol? I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I I don't really know, but it's quite funny because it's still connected to like health. So it's not seen as this like bad thing. It's seen mm-hmm. as this healthy thing because it's also like it can disinfect like wounds or whatnot. I'm guessing like it, it mm-hmm. sucks because like every alcohol because it's just like a fun thing to do. I don't really know why. Why? What did he say? Because Islam, you know, pro- prohibits uh, alcohol. So oh, for years, but you also have an alcohol. We have, but in Ottoman times, <laughs> uh, it was not okay to drink. In the Republic of Turkey, of course, it's normal. But then they mm-hmm. um, they didn't like. You had to pay extra probably to be able to drink alcohol. You know. So in Turkey, still, mm-hmm. if you are selling alcohol, you pay a lot more tax than other places. Wow. So not every cafe mm-hmm. or restaurant can provide alcohol in Turkey still. So that's why Rakia became a symbol of freedom and victory over Islam after Ottoman Empire died. <laughs> Is this also about Enat? Yes, I guess so. <laughs> a symbol of freedom, victory and Enat. <laughs> Exactly. I think that should be in our oh man, it should be like a motto or something. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, good. Absolutely. Now I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm jumping into another part, which is husbands and wives. So oh, no. he says husbands <laughs> take their wives out, usually in the company with another married couple. Mm-hmm. But women cannot go to one event. At all. It is an unwritten rule. What is this? Alone? <laughs> Not alone, with their husband. Their husband goes there, but women don't go. So wait, they, uh, a husband can go to some event? Which event? Yeah, a kind of event that nor- normally only men go. Women. Ah. It's an unwritten rule that women are strictly <laughs> unforbidden. Wow. I don't, I mean, definitely not the truth anymore, but I think when, at the time when he was like, it's a bit more traditional, right? I can totally see Mm -hmm, that happening. I'm guessing also because of the roles, right? Like women were also the ones staying home and like taking care of the house Mm -hmm. and the kids and everything. You don't really like, it's a full-time job. You don't really have time to think about politics or like go to events, but guys are the ones that go out and go to like Mm -hmm. work or whatever. And they're the ones that maybe are more kind of, you know surrounded by these things and can you know see because a wife yeah. goes somewhere to meet someone like you know like as you said like couples that are friends or whatever mm-hmm. or to go to the store like you know because <laughs> and, and it's not like being demeaning towards anyone like that was a hard tough job that they had but yeah. i'm guessing that they were just not exposed to it that much and uh, and yeah as you said it became it's this traditional thing Mm. Not anymore, it's, though, guys. Yeah, yeah, it is only, he says, only one day. Sunday, male clique at a kafana. So that is, like, a tradition. Yeah. Sunday. That's also, um, yeah. Sunday kafana meetup. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. But, yeah, kafanas were places where you go to discuss things. This, this, mm-hmm. this is where you have, like, you know, I don't want to say fights, but you have really like serious discussions uh, with your friends as well, with anyone, you know, this is where you go to debate things. So Mm -hmm. yeah, they were like meeting points. And um, that's like, especially like in Belgrade, right? We have this one bohemian area right there Mm -hmm. where um, it's well known for people that were like artists, academics, and, you know, they would also go and sit and discuss these things. Mm -hmm. And again, traditionally just wasn't like a place for a woman. Um, because of circumstances, I'm guessing, you know, but yeah. I'm pretty sure that I, I can't see women going alone to a kafana, right? Mm-hmm. That's another thing. <laughs> Before. One um, critique, let's say, for Serbia. Serbia is the only country that advertises itself as a hospitable in tourist brochures, but we charge for everything, he says. What do you mean? So we charge for water for like toilets for everything but we say we are hospitable so while charging for everything we are still Ah. claiming that we are hospitable but what is hospitable when we charge for everything he is saying (laughs) (laughs) 
So, you know, I, I can't really like answer this question that much because I grew up in a city uh, that's really tiny. Mm-hmm. So we didn't really have any tourists, right? Mm-hmm. So, and if someone would come in, then it would be like, you would actually like accept that person and you would pay for that person. And they mm-hmm. would be like, yeah, exactly. As a guest, they would be like at your place for free and everything. I can definitely see that happening. But probably in Belgrade where there's like so many tourists, mm-hmm. it's a def- different mentality right they're like well you know i can accommodate one person but like imagine if i give everything for free then yeah but i'm thinking about certain contexts like context like uh for example in a cafe you don't pay for water Mm -hmm. you know you don't pay if you want to go to uh like just go to the restroom you don't yeah of course not in the restaurant but if you don't ask for the tap water then of course you pay for it (laughs) Yeah, yeah, sure. But it can't, yeah, that's true, because you have to... I think he's criticizing the I mean, in, agencies, the tourist agencies. They are using these hospitable uh, things, and then they are charging so many things for the tourists, I guess. Oh, I can see definitely see the shadiness in it. Like, I can definitely see that. Like, maybe potentially tricking people. And I mean, I think it happens in every country, but probably because we are boasting so much that we are such good hosts, you know, and then yeah. when it happens, it's kind of like, well, you should have been, <laughs> you know, so loud. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Before we continue with the show, here's a quick reminder. This podcast is free for everyone and supported by listeners like you. If you have found this podcast useful and companion to you so far, and if you have the means, we will appreciate your help. To support us to continue with this podcast, you can buy us a cup of coffee. To do that, go to buymeacoffee.com slash podcast and choose how many cups of coffee you would like to send us. Your support will give us courage and means to continue creating useful content for everyone who wants to learn more about the Serbian language and culture. Thanks for joining us. Now let's get back to our episode. Okay. Another one, in Serbia, time is not money. Everyone has more than enough of it, <laughs> he says. Wait, can you repeat it? Because it was a yeah. bit lagging. Uh-huh. In Serbia, time is not money, unlike other countries. Everyone has more than enough of it. <laughs> Definitely. I, I, that, I think one of the, the things that I kind of like uh, talk about all the time in Serbia, there's a lot about like the community. And mm-hmm. I think communities are really important for your like life and well-being and whatever. There's not much emphasis on the career path, right? Mm-hmm. As we see in the West. So it, it, when you finish with your work, you don't go home and work or like do a course or something like that. Or, you know, mm-hmm. it's and I'm just talking about the majority, not yeah. talking about like, the minority that actually like does that Mm -hmm. but and again i think it's just becoming like a more like um you know we are definitely progressing much more in that section but yeah people spend a lot of time in a cafe i was gonna say like i see people sitting in a cafe all day or all afternoon (laughs) yeah there's a very clear distinction like i go to work Mm -hmm. and when i finish work I finish work. I don't stay mm-hmm. longer. I finish exactly at that time and that's it. And then I go home and then I can do whatever I want. I can hang out with my friends. I can go for a cafe, to a cafe. I can be with my family. I can do this or that, whatever you want to do. But you don't have that need like, oh my God, I have to, okay, if I want to progress in my career, I have to like work on the weekends. Definitely. It's a very rare thing. in Serbia. I think this is healthier. Yeah, because again, we value a lot like human contact and meaningful relationships. So yeah, more than work. Okay, next one. There is also closeness, which is a very nice thing when you think of it. But on the other hand, you are bombarded with direct questions or evaluations. Like they, if you see someone that you barely know, you can still ask that person, where are you going? <laughs> <Your answer. laughs> Nothing is private. Nothing is private. Especially, I think the the concept of closeness is really, really um, very much present in... It kind of... It still, like, it still sticks, even though the... Mm-hmm. I don't want to... The society changed, right? We have access to the internet. There's a lot of, like, you know, mm-hmm. privacy. Like, you don't just go to someone else's place and be like, hey, 
I'm here to visit you. That's not okay anymore, right? But there's still yeah. this traditional view where like everyone's in everyone's business, you know, <laughs> especially the family. Mm-hmm. And if you decide not to answer something or be like, you know, be a bit secretive, it's going to be like, what are you hiding? What? Like, <laughs> like, what the fuck are you hiding? Like, or like, you're just weird or you're just like mm-hmm. a not mate- good material. Like I can't, I can, nah. it's like, I can't trust you basically. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's what, it, what it's saying. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, there's a, everyone's everybody's not business where you're going when it comes to like your yeah. neighborhood or your family, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm quite used to it. So for me, it's like, you know, I don't hide things from like, that's how I grew up. So I'm just, I was just like, I'm guessing oversharing. So now when mm-hmm. I go, when, I, when I'm in Germany or when I was in Austria, like I noticed that like, oh my God, here that's totally oversharing or over asking or like, you know, like no being nosy and so on. No, we don't have mm-hmm. that distinction. It It's kind of like, as you said, closeness is like, um, it's kind of being nosy, but yeah. also, hey, you're my person, you know? Yeah, definitely. Similar to that, also foreigners, he says, would never understand our boundless interest in other people's appearance. So either you lost so much weight or you gained weight or something happened to your appearance and they directly tell you that, he says. Yeah, that's not a taboo <laughs> in our society. You, It's kind of like health like reasons. Hey, you gained some weight. Like, what are you going to do? Like, And then the other person is going to be like, they're not even offended. They're like, yeah, I've been eating chocolate. Like, you know, <laughs> it's not going to be like, oh, my God. That's not what you don't ask that. You don't ask for age or for like <laughs> weight or whatever. It's like not a taboo thing here. I see. All right. Going back to family. So no wife can ever hope to match the unsurpassed taste of mother-in-law Sarma, nor the perfection and art of her ironing. Okay. <laughs> no. I mean, yes, correct. <laughs> so, uh, but I... Uh, But everyone loves their mom's cuisine, right? I guess so. Like, you just get, it's like a thing that's familiar and you get used to it. And for you, that's tasty, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's familiar. That's true. But here, no one can ever hope. So they are just, they accept it. So they don't do anything about it. They just accept it and stay in peace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you, you know, when you get married, just you have to respect Mm. their, like your partner's mom. That's just how it is. And, you know, they as well can be very nosy. And sometimes, like, also, like, you know, may very mean depending on... Because they're like, it's my baby. Again, there's this, like, traditional view where everyone's... There's no separation. This family... Has, no, like, we're all a family. So everyone's just, like, uh, being like, why did you do that? Like, you you actually... It's really funny, but my sister had a, mm-hmm. a situation... It's not like she didn't have issues or anything like that. But she mm-hmm. came into like the house of her husband where also her Mm -hmm. um, mother and father-in-law were uh, living and the thing is that you have to figure out what's the dynamic now you know because before that the mom was the one like you know taking care of these household things and whatever exactly and um, so now you're like okay now there's this incoming person and you have to figure out what the dynamic is Definitely. I think it's very similar in Turkey as well. I'm I'm quite sure that a lot of things really overlap. Next one is different. Uh, So you live in Germany and you use subway, like metro, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think of metro? Do you think Belgrade or Serbia needs a subway or would be better with a subway? Um, I really didn't use the transport like transportation in in serbia that often um Mm -hmm. i heard in belgrade that it's really really bad because it takes you like hours to get to one place also one of the things for me Mm -hmm. was that like sometimes i wouldn't even know what the the stop is the station is i'll be like which station is this is this a station and where are the numbers of the buses you know so it's i think very inefficient you have to know it if you're there you know it's not like you can look up that information online and be like i'm fine and i think that they're planning on having 
like making the the subway uh mm -hmm. but it's gonna be like in 10 years or something like that <laughs> minimum <laughs> like it's gonna be done uh-huh in germany when you use it how do you feel like when you look at the people do they li seem happy like going in the subway or do they talk mm. to each other or do they read whatever they want to read or play games on their phones very individualistic actually uh sometimes mm. if you would like uh i would sometimes see it in the buses like older people want to talk to you you know but um yeah but i so, again i haven't used the uh, like the buses in serbia that much how is it so he i used that in baghdad and realized people talk a lot on the buses so he says serbians are made for streets and daylight a subway would make us depressive yeah there's that like It, 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 yeah if you in that sense definitely like you go in and it's not like you're quiet or no you just like talk or like it's not a taboo but here even if i take my phone and talk in the bus mm -hmm. oh my god like you're yeah. disrupting the peace and the you know this but you can hear like music in serbia and so on so yeah mm -hmm. again we crave that like human contact so uh, <laughs> that's that explains it yeah next one is about women or girls in Belgrade or in Serbia. He says, today a Belgrade girl is independent and free. Sex is not a secret yeah. for her anymore. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, not, a, not such a taboo thing. I do still think that it's not discussed as much as it should be. But yeah, mm. I think uh, that's also something that my boyfriend pointed out. It's not about being this strong, independent woman and like, I don't need you or whatever. It's about just, um, you know, like uh, being aware that you can do it on your own. Mm -hmm. You do want a f partner. You do want a family. You do want this and that. You can go out and, you know, have casual sex. But just mm -hmm. like, um, first, I'm an individual. And then, you know, I can be a part of. So it's like, a, I think we're not oppressed in that sense anymore mm -hmm. you know um but yeah very very again globalized modernized this idea yes. of western society as well yeah mm -hmm. true when it comes to gentlemen though he says you can find them more in villages than in towns and least uh in the suburbs so true gentlemen in serbia they live in villages more than in towns And mm -hmm. you can find them, you can barely find them in the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that goes back to like uh, being in a city, like a big city like Belgrade. It's just like mm -hmm. a full of options, right? So um, yeah. you don't need to be a gentleman. You can do whatever you want. You're still going to have options, right? So there's always mm -hmm. something around the corner. But for people that are possibly, as you said, in a suburb or like villages and have that like slightly different mentality, you're like, you, you, you grew up like with different values and different circumstances. So maybe the thing is that I've never dated anyone from Belgrade. Maybe that's the reason why. <laughs> but uh, maybe, but who knows? Yeah, guys, uh, I mean, girls, be aware. <laughs> okay, last question. And I think that suits you. Well, as well, because you live abroad. While in Serbia, we grumble about it being primitive and neglected, and then we fly out to better worlds and get homesick for our own food, people, and towns. Yeah, we are really good at complaining, are we not? Right? <laughs> um, maybe it's... That's, that's actually a good question. I, Do you I think, feel that? Uh, yes, I definitely feel that. I Maybe not as much as some other people, but I will tell you my experience. I think life is not one thing. I think there's like a, it's not, there's like no, pr for me, it's very difficult to say this is my priority, right? There's certain things that I would like to do. So I care about my family. So I want to have that connection with them. So that really like, that's the reason why I'm always going to be tied to Serbia. Always, always. Mm -hmm. And of course, culture, like that's part of your identity, right? If you go somewhere else, like as much as you can maybe connect with someone else, that part of your identity is always going to be like very strong. If you grew up like up to, I don't know, like I was like 23 when I left. So I was already grown mm -hmm. up. 
I already have, I had yeah. like everything like settled, you know, everything in place and all my thoughts and so on. And then, and then, you know, of course your country doesn't give you everything you want. And I, I needed to like see how I can, I wanted to develop myself in that like career a bit aspect not I don't really want to say just career just I wanted to have more opportunities to learn about different mm -hmm. things and I felt like I couldn't really do that in the place where I was and um, so I never want to say like oh you know uh, I chose career over like uh, family you know mm -hmm. um, because to me there is like there are certain things that that are there uh, at a very similar level for me it was like more mm -hmm. self um not self cre something like not self creation but you know what i mean self realization that's what it realization, is realization development yeah but do you miss that like primitive things about serbia like the bread homemade bread or i don't know <laughs> the things that you complained about there uh, yeah, I miss things that are, that are familiar. So anything can go in that. I mean, I mean, even it's, it's funny, but like now when I go to the market, which is like definitely not the maybe like the cleanest or, you know, or like the most mm -hmm. organized of things or like I'm just saying like a, a, like a, a objectively if someone looks at they're going to like this is like this is looks horrible or whatever, you know, but for me, it's like. That's what I'm used to. That's what I know. That's what's familiar. I know how to navigate here, <laughs> even though it has its like good or bad sides. Mm -hmm. I, these are like, that's, I think things that are familiar, whether it be good or bad, they mm -hmm. stick with you, Yeah. you know? So yeah, I definitely feel uh, like I miss certain things and people and places and mm -hmm. food and so on. Yeah. But I think it's really good to have that space to go back to and to, you know, yeah. combine yeah. best of both worlds. It's missing in a good way because you know you'll get it someday or you will experience it one more time or regularly at least. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Ivana. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Really philosophical questions, you know. <laughs> yeah, deep ones, but you yeah. answered them very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah, I, uh, let us know in the comments if that you agree with something, you disagree, what are your experiences. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just share everything we like we love to know what you think All right prietno svima prietno thank you for joining us today we hope you enjoyed our podcast and learned something new in case you have any comments suggestions or questions make sure to share them on our instagram page Kafa podcast prietno